This is Bernard Green, Chair of the Brookline Select Board. And this is the regular meeting of the Brookline Select Board for Tuesday, April 21st, 2020. We're meeting with all five members of the Select Board participating remotely using the WebEx events meeting platform. Let me start with a few comments and then other select board members can add their comments or announcements uh, or updates. This week, the emphasis in town has been on stressing the importance, the absolute importance of wearing face coverings whenever people are out and about in public. Brookline's health director, Dr. Swanee Jett, issued an advisory effective Friday, April 17, mandating the wearing of face coverings at all times when in public. Later this evening, we will discuss and vote on a select board guidance on face coverings that is intended to answer some of the questions that people have had about the health department advisory over the last few days. The health department advisory is intended to get everyone to wear face coverings, but especially young people purpose is not to protect the person wearing the face covering, but to protect other people if you have the virus and are contagious but have few, if any, symptoms. This will help present, prevent the transmission of the virus to large numbers of people, which will help us get the virus under control so that we can return to a somewhat uh, amount of, of normal um, functioning uh, as, as soon as possible. Under control means that we're reducing the transmission rate so that, no, so that uh, a person with the virus will transmit it, hopefully to less than one other person on average. At that rate, we can get the virus sufficiently under control. But to get to that reduction, we need widespread compliance with the health department guidance in Brookline and in other communities that have widely implemented mandatory face covering orders. We have received emails from residents with health issues who feel threatened by runners and bikers whooshing by them without face covering. And if you were outside this weekend as I was, you would see that we have a huge problem, especially with young people, runners and bikers who flout the face mask requirement as if this virus were just a minor annoyance. The worst violators are the people who most need to wear face covering. Young and healthy people who think they're invincible and even if they contracted the virus will likely not suffer any symptoms, but they will still be contagious. I've asked Dr. Jett to implement additional ways of impressing upon people the need to take seriously the requirement that they wear a face covering. And we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but Two of the ideas that uh, we are going to implement are sound trucks, like Boston is using, especially on paths that people use to run or bike, and more pointed signage in our parks and streets. Well, that's my view. Uh, other select board members can express their views, make any other comments or announcements and updates. Uh, does anyone have any, anything else to uh, add to this? No. Uh, Mr. Green, did you want us to, um, is now the time to talk about work of, in the various committees that we're on? Yeah, yes. Okay, so I'll just give a quick update on the Census Complete Count Committee. Um, we have been trying, you know, to figure out ways to uh, reach especially um, uh, vulnerable populations. And one of the efforts was, uh, had started a few weeks ago when we uh, were able to, uh, with the help of the Brooklyn Housing Authority, um, uh, give flyers to everyone who came to the Brooklyn uh, Food Pantry. Uh, the way the food pantry works is that every other week there are different people who come, a different group of people. So the town uh, printed more flyers last week, and those should be starting to go out today to the second group of uh, food pantry uh, recipients. Um, I'm also uh, reached out to the libraries and I've heard back 
and they're eager to work with us on how we get the get the notices out to everyone about the importance of the census. As you probably know, the libraries in the past were very important places where people got information about the census and also could use the computers in the library if they didn't have one. Um, so we have to figure out how best that can go forward. And uh, we're working on that now. I would just, I would also say that I probably like everyone, I've been watching a little more TV than I normally do. And I have seen quite a number of ads for the census, uh, especially on the news channels. So I hope people are paying attention and understand the importance of filling out the census. Um, and uh, you can uh, go to 2020, 20, uh, 2020 census uh, slash gov and uh, fill it out online. Um, and uh, in a minute, I'll get you the phone number. <laughs> I don't have it right on me, but it's very, very important. Updates or announcements? I can go ahead. Um, and just to be clear, that, that website is my2020census.gov, my2020census.gov. Okay, I left out the my, sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> um, I'll also, um, just a couple quick things. One is um, this Thursday, if it's Thursday at 9 a.m., we have our Small Business uh, Development Committee virtual town hall uh, featuring uh, our phenomenal uh, staff from Economic Development, Kara Bruton and Meredith Mooney. Uh, so uh, please, even if you're just uh, interested to hear what's going on, there's been a lot of news about support for small businesses lately. Um, you can go to brooklinema.gov slash calendar, and that'll get you all the info you need. Uh, by the way, for all of our meetings, um, figure out how to, how to log in using WebEx or Zoom or whatever the tool is that's being used there. If you just want to watch, you can watch a lot of these meetings also from home. Uh, if you have Comcast or RC on the big channel, Brookline Interactive Group, or at brooklineinteractive.org, that takes you to a live stream if you just want to watch and see what's going on. So I encourage you to do that, not just for this virtual town hall, for, but for all the meetings that are going on around town, you'll see on our calendar. Um, the other thing is just an update on the safety net fund. Uh, you know, you, you've all really, really responded here um, to the great need that there is. Um, the latest numbers I got from this afternoon is that we are knocking on the door of $300,000 in donations. Wow. 299349 as of 3.30 this afternoon. Maybe we already hit it. Uh, and that is in addition to um, the $175,000 commitment that this board has made that we'll also be discussing uh, and um, finalizing, hopefully, after a public hearing tonight. Um, with that said, the need is still very great. You see that um, that even from the very beginning of this, uh, we, we did not know what, uh, for instance, April would look like, and, and we don't yet know what May and into the summer is going to look like. Um, the need is still great. Uh, so please, if you can, if you're able, continue to contribute to the safety net fund as well as a lot of the other great um, organizations out there doing the work uh, like the food pantry and so many others. So I uh, hope you'll continue to do that. Thanks. Thank you. Any other updates or announcements or comments? Um, I, I had two on. announcements. One, uh, I'll be leading a virtual town hall uh, for faith communities tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Uh, information can be found on the town website. And then I also want to plug um, Harry, Harvey uh, Braverman's Soul Witness, the Brookline Witness Project in honor of Holocaust Remembrance Day. If you visit, um, I believe it is soulwitness.org, uh, it is free to uh, rent or buy um, for a limited time. Great, thank you. Any other updates, announcements, or comments? I'll just give a quick update on the virtual town meeting uh, committee. Uh, the, that committee continues to meet uh, and uh, press ahead with the planning for the upcoming May, uh, excuse me, June town meeting now. Uh, next meeting, 7.30 p.m. tomorrow evening. Details on how to join that meeting uh, on the town website. Um, I'll also put a plug in for anybody who hasn't yet um, any time meeting member or time meeting candidate who hasn't yet filled out the survey that was circulated to you. Um, very helpful to us as we think about uh, technology availability and do planning for how we can make this June town meeting 
as smooth as possible. So please, uh, please com uh, complete it and, uh, and be counted. Um, and uh, let us know what your technology availability and needs are. Thank you, Ben. If, uh, if I may, I'd like to give a shout out to Boston University, who is assisting with the uh, planning of uh, the virtual town meeting. And uh, in so many ways, Boston University, um, you know, right here in Brookline, is being a really, really great partner as we struggle through this COVID virus uh, crisis, as well as hopefully afterwards, as we uh, make use of the great uh, uh, resources of this world-class university to help uh, our community uh, in so many ways. So that's uh, my plug for BU, even though I was not a, I'm not an alumni of BU. <laughs> Nonetheless, I, I think they're doing a great job. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, could I, could I say one more thing? Um, sure. At 521 uh, this afternoon, just before this meeting began, the governor announced the schools will be closed um, through the end of June. So that gives us a little bit of a hint of what May is and, and June are going to look like since uh, before we had a, the kids were supposed to go back on uh, May 5th. So, right. um, well, you know, it's clear that this is going to be a new norm for us for a while, I think. That's true, unfortunately. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, pressure throughout the country to get back to normal quickly. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, any uh, return to even a semblance of normal, normalcy is uh, dri uh, data-driven and not uh, politics-driven. Um, I think that uh, in Brookline, we're fortunate that uh, we're not under that type of pressure, but still, um, you know, we, we can't uh, go back to normal unless um, until the virus tells us we can go back to normal. That's, I think that's a critical important. Uh, one one more thing I'd like to I'd like to say is that we uh, over the weekend I was speaking to a resident uh, about uh, some issues with a nursing home and, and Star Market, but he said that he does not receive our telephone calls, and uh, it's because I think he does not have a landline. And so for those people who may be listening, and and uh, I, I don't know, but apparently there is a place on the on the website called a uh, box called notify me at the uh, upper right hand corner if you go into that box there's a place to enter your phone number and your email um so that you will get the most up-to-date information from the town great thank and you can you. use any phone number uh doesn't doesn't require landline correct, correct. but i yeah. i think we we get the landlines from verizon is that not correct Yes, and then it's up to people to add or, right. or replace uh, right. their preferred number. Right. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I make one announcement, please? Sure. So uh, and we've had some um, questions about uh, trash collection in terms of the volume of trash. Um, uh, obviously, there's a lot of people who are home, and uh, people are using that time to, to clean, a lot of cleaning going on. And so uh, <laughs> one request was... Uh, was to perhaps have some amnesty for the overflow bags. Um, I think what we've decided to do is um, advance a amnesty day um, every year or a, maybe twice a year in our contract with our, um, our, our collection vendor. Uh, they're obligated to provide two um, uh, days of pickup where uh, there's no limitation. It doesn't have to be in your uh, regular size uh, cart. So uh, we are going to move that up uh, to the week of May 11th, uh, so more information will be coming on that. So for those of you who like to clean uh, and declutter, um, May 11th is your week. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything else? I, 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 let me just add, I, I received a couple calls uh, regarding our um, reverse 911 calls uh, from people in the uh, Orthodox uh, Jewish community concerned about uh, receiving the calls during the time of their Sabbath. Uh, just want to let you know that we've we've heard those concerns and uh, we'll make sure that uh, in the future uh, calls go out before uh, sundown on Friday so that uh, everyone has an opportunity to uh, receive the information that uh, we're putting out to the community. Um, so. Devin, um, are there any, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I, I had a follow-up question to what uh, Mr. Kleckner was talking about with the trash collection. Um, I know that we 
had been doing, uh, I think it's called the pink bag with clothing donations. Is that temporary, uh, temporarily suspended? Is that included on the amnesty day? I know I've been one of the people cleaning stuff out and one of the things I'd like to get rid of are the bags of clothes. Um, I've tried to take them to some of the donation uh, centers, but their boxes are overflowing. And I think some of the uh, places won't accept them for the time being because of the risk of contamination. Um, so good question. I don't have the answer right now, but I, I will before this meeting's over. The, the pink bag program is separate from the amnesty program we're talking about, but I'll find out um, if they're not being picked up and why and what the plans are for doing that or perhaps some alternative uh, methods. Thank you. Great. Okay, anything else? Okay, um, Devin, have we received any requests to uh, make public comment? No one signed up for public comment in advance uh, this week. We do have about 10 or so residents um, who have joined us as an attendee in this WebEx event. Um, so they can, you know, either chat me privately or use the hand raise feature to identify that they'd like to speak um, in public comment. Um, but no one has, has formally requested at this time. Right. Um, I see that um, uh, Bob Miller has uh, put in a comment about signage in uh, grocery stores. I think we're, we can talk about that later on um, in the meeting and that's relevant. So, okay, anything else? Okay, uh, calendar. First question of approving the minutes of the April 10, 2020 and April 14, 2020 select board meetings. Um, any questions or edits, corrections to those minutes? Okay, I gave some uh, edits um, and uh, I move approval of the minutes of first April 10, 2020 um, as amended. Uh, all in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? He said hi. Aye. Uh, aye. Um, Ms. Hamilton? I was muted. Aye. aye. Uh, Mr. Fernandez? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Uh, I move approval of the eight, uh, April 14, 2020 minutes. That was our special meeting. Uh, on Friday, is that Friday or? Thursday, I believe. Whatever. Thursday, okay. Um, all in favor of uh, those uh, minutes, um, please by saying aye, Mr. Franco. Aye. Ms. Heller. Aye. Ms. Hamilton. Aye. Fernandez. Aye. And chair votes aye. Next, question of approving the application for alternate manager Young Yik Wu for Koto Japanese uh, Restaurant doing business as Osaka Japanese Restaurant at 14 Green Street, Brookline. Uh, Osaka Japanese Restaurant is a holder of an all alcoholic beverages common victualler license. Um, I assume that they are not uh, present at, at this meeting. Um, is there anything that anyone um, or any, that anyone can add to what's in our packet, or do people have any questions? No? I move yeah, approval. Okay. I move approval of the application for alternate manager for Young Yik Wu for Koto Japanese restaurant doing business as Osaka Japanese restaurant at 14 Green Street. Um, restaurant is a holder of an all alcoholic beverages common victualler License. Uh, all in favor, Mr. Franco? Uh, aye. Ms. Heller? Aye. Um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Um, Mr. Fernandez? Aye. And chair votes aye. Okay. My studio here is not as uh, efficiently organized as it can be, so let's move on. 
Human resources. This question of permitting effective March 13, 2020 vacation time to accrue in excess of the six or eight limits in the cases of affected non-union town and Brookline employees through December 31st, 2020. Um, on July 1st, 2021, the beginning of the next fiscal year, the accrual limits will be reinstituted. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kleckner, is there anything you want to add to that? Or, or uh, thank Brogge? you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and and Ann Braga is here, and um, I think she can uh, speak on this. This is an action of the Human Resources Board that requires approval of the select board given its uh, involvement with collective bargaining um, uh, contracts. Ann? Good evening. This is Ann Braga, HR Director for the Town of Brookline. Um, the action before you affects non-union employees. Um, and this, uh, we have some um, managers and um, department heads who are bumping up against their, their required caps or carryover limits um, as a result of not being able to take time off um, and, and obviously no, with nowhere to go as well. Um, the, the HR board met last week and voted for the uh, union employees to be able to move outside of the caps and the carryovers, um, which is required under the collective bargaining agreements that the HR board um, make those, those exceptions. We are looking to make it consistent for the non-union managers as well as the department heads as well. This does not affect a large number of employees um, because it would require sort of an extensive um, number of years in service. Um, but we wanted to make it um, available for those folks who, you know, had planned to take time and stay under their cap um, or their carryover, but out of obviously no, no uh, means of their own um, with what's going on with COVID-19 um, to be able to not be penalized for um, being able to um, accrue during that time. So we're asking for your approval tonight for non-union employees and departments. Okay, any questions? Okay, I move approval uh, of permitting effective March 13, 2020 vacation time to accrue in excess of the six or eight week limits in the cases of affected non-union town of Brookline employees through December 31st, 2020. All in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? Aye. Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Fernandez? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Thank you. Bernard, can I, yes. can I, I actually just have a follow-up question. Uh, I didn't get it in under the deadline before. Um, <laughs> we'll extend the deadline. Thank you. So uh, let's assume one of these longtime employees retires in the next six months um, with an extra uh, week of, of vacation time. Would we be uh, in a position where we had to pay out for that additional time, um, buy back the vacation time, or would the union contract only allow for the negotiated maximum? So if it's a long time, are you talking a union employee or a non-union employee? Not that it matters, I guess. So either way, um, they, they would, um, because this vote has happened of the HR board in the case of a union employee and the select board of a non-union employee, um, we would be um, required to pay that out. We would look for the, the department and the employee to, to look where there's an opportunity to take time sometime um, moving forward for them to do that. Um, I would expect that the number of employees affected is under 50 um, and probably more likely under 25. Um, and, and so, um, that, um, you know, it's not going to be, it's not a significant number and it's also not affecting, um, all the people that are eligible for retirement either. So, um, I'm not expecting that to be a, a big budgetary impact. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Braga. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. You too. Okay, we have a public hearing at six o'clock, uh, four minutes ahead of time. So what do you want to do? Anyone have a joke to tell? <laughs> Maybe a story about what you've been doing while in your bunker. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I've been cleaning also, and I found a lot of clothes that no longer fit. They're still in my closet. <laughs> I need to get rid of them. Well, I'll put a plug in for, uh, I don't know if they're still uh, collecting now, but uh, the Epilepsy Foundation, uh, which is a very good charitable uh, group, uh, collects clothing and will come to your house and take them off the porch. I don't know whether they still are, but um, it is it is worth looking into. I think Big Brother's Big Sister also does it, and I believe some of the vet, veter, veter, veteran organizations also do that, so that that's a possibility. Great, thank I, you. I have an update uh, briefly on the on that issue. So the pink bag program is, is in fact, in been suspended during the pandemic. Um, I will find out some more information about alternatives like some of you suggest, Nancy, but uh, my guess is that most of them are not in effect for obvious reasons. I'll use this uh, opportunity to plug uh, one more organization who's having an event next week. Uh, Steps for Success usually has a very big fundraiser uh, this time of year, and they've uh, retooled and they're going to go virtual. So next Wednesday evening, the 29th, they will be doing a uh, virtual uh, event. So I'm sure you can find more information on their page. I assume it's going to be a bring your own bottle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we still have two minutes to go. I did want to just let everyone know um, the way that we are going to take comments for public hearings moving forward um, is, of course, you're eligible to send in your comments ahead of time, and then those will be shared um, during the public hearing. But also, if you join the WebEx event as an attendee, either by phone or um, using the WebEx application you can raise your hand and privately chat me and then we'll promote you to a panelist and enable you to give your feedback in the public hearing and that's how they'll they'll work moving forward okay uh devin have you received any comments uh for the two hearings we have tonight we have not <laughs> no. okay it's Six o'clock, more or less. Um, let's move on to the hearing. Uh, community development block grant public hearing. Uh, we have uh, five items that we have to approve. Uh, first, approval, approve a substantial amendment to the town's fiscal year 20 uh, annual action plan in support of the Brookline Community Health Center's safety net program. Secondly, authorize the transfer of funds between fiscal year 20 CDBG Accounts uh, from affordable housing uh, to a safety net, $75,000. Um, three, authorize the Director of Planning and Community Development to execute administrative and programmatic documents needed to complete the substantial amendment and transfer of funds. Four, authorize and approve the chair to execute a contract between the town and the Brookline Center the community mental health for the safety net program and five question of approving and authorizing the chair to execute a contract between the town and the brookline community foundation for the brookline safety net fund um any questions from the board first i'll just uh, this is mel kleckner <clears throat> i would just uh, repeat uh i know select board member uh, and that does indicated that this, these are all actions related to the board's prior actions to authorize uh, or endorse um, transfers uh, of $75,000 from the CDBG and $100,000 from the uh, affordable housing uh, trust fund. And uh, primarily we're dealing with the uh, CDBG this evening. And Mr. Viola, Joe Viola from the planning department is here to walk us through these, uh, these various votes. Okay, uh, Mr. Viola, why don't you start uh, with with your presentation, and then we'll open it up to the public for uh, comment. Sure. Thank you, Joe Viola, Assistant Director for Community Planning. Um, as was noted, 
we're following up from the, the board's March 31st meeting for those two sums of money, the $75,000 in community development block grant and the $100,000 in housing trust. Just wanted to clarify that this has been a learning process for exactly what constitutes the, uh, the safety net. The safety net is actually a program run by the Brookline Community Foundation. They're a funder of the safety net, but the safety net is also a program that's run through the Brookline Community Mental Health Center. Uh, the Community Foundation and the, Brooklyn, and the Brookline Center both interact. They're both very well coordinated. We've had conversations with both Frank Steinfield and, and, and um, and uh, Ian from the Brookline Center for Community Mental Health to try to figure out how best to, to administer this funding uh, to get it out on the street as quickly as possible to help, help those that are in need. Um, with respect to the block grant, anytime we we're looking to fund something that wasn't included in our prior action plan, uh, whether it's a new recipient or if we're looking to transfer funds, we have to have what's called a substantial, we have to do in a substantial amendment requires a public hearing. That's why we're here this evening. Uh, in keeping with the CARES Act and an abbreviated time frame, we're actually able to do a, a much more condensed and expedited process. Uh, we, we posted a legal ad last, last Thursday, and here we are tonight. Uh, the requirement was five days of notice. Um, and in public comment. I should note that we have not, the legal ad that went out allowed for uh, residents to contact us directly with any public comments they had uh, with respect to the money going to the community foundation, or excuse me, to the Center for Community Mental Health and, and for the transfer of those funds. We have not received any public comment. I just wanted to, to let the board know that. Um, so after your, after your vote tonight, um, this fulfills the, the regulatory requirement uh, for HUD to allow us to move forward to, to actually program this money uh, and contractually obligate it to the Brookline Center for Community Mental Health. That's related to block grant. I, I, I'm happy to explain the how the housing trust portion is, is much less complicated. Um, there is less restriction on using housing trust funds uh, those funds will be administered directly through the Brookline Community Foundation. They'll administer the funds on behalf of the town. In the case of the funding going to the Brookline Center for Community Mental Health, the town itself will be the administrator of those funds. Um, and again, this is a construct of, of having sat down around a table trying to figure out how to make these programs work with Ian Lang and, and Frank Steinfield. I'm happy to answer any kind of logistical or any other questions you may have on how the money will be going out the door or who it'll serve? Well, I have one question. Um, there's a phone number that we're to, that people in need are to call uh, to uh, obtain assistance. Is that phone um, number uh, properly staffed to uh, receive calls? If I guess my, 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 my suggestion is to look into that because it doesn't look like it is. If we're referring to the, the Brookline Center, so we'll I'll jump ahead a little bit to what their contract states, but part of the funding that we're making available through block grant funding is actually to help them to get up to, we're looking to help them build capacity to run that program, which they don't okay. currently have. So the block grant funding will be used, a portion of it will be used to create the equivalent of a one full-time employee uh, you know, obviously the need is there and the requests are growing and um, we're helping to, to build their capacity with block grant funds, a portion of those block grant funds. Great. That'll, that'll help to address what you just, you just mentioned. Right. Yeah, very important information. Any other uh, questions before we go to the uh, public? So I have a question, just maybe a clarifying question about which pot of CDBG money we're talking about. We get we get an annual um, allotment from the federal government, and then it's my understanding that there's a special um, additional set of funding that's coming as a result of COVID-19. This seventy-five thousand dollars, which which of those two pots is it coming out of? The, the typical year over year, or this special? Um, allotment that we're getting because of the current crisis 
So the $75,000 is from a prior year, uh, uncommitted, unexpected, un expended, um, expended funds that are, are being compiled specifically for, uh, the use we're talking about tonight. Um, as you mentioned, as, uh, the board knows uh, there's an additional pot of money for which we'll be back before you again to do another substantial amendment and to have some funding recommendations, but those two pots are separate. So I think it would be fair to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this is the first of several funding votes that this board will take. And um, the $75,000 plus the additional housing trust fund uh, funds are, are sort of a down payment on, on response. Um, more to come in, in future weeks. Exactly, this is the first wave of funding. I think it's also important to emphasize that this is uh, owed money from a previous fiscal year that was not spent in the, in that fiscal year. So it's not taking money away from any uh, other of the worthy causes that are funded by the CDBG uh, grant monies. Uh, this is um, money that was in a certain sense laying around that we were able to use for this uh, purpose. Uh, maybe laying around is not the right uh, way of phrasing it, but um, the, the point being that this is not depriving any other of the CDBG uses uh, of funding. That's correct. Also, um, I, you know, I noticed in the contract, I imagine this is this is standard with all the CDBG um, uh, contracts, uh, that there's reporting requirements in terms of the number of people served by income level, by race and ethnicity, and by other mm -hmm. factors as well. And I think those are quarterly, is that right? That is, that's a standard, that's our standard procedure with, with funding quarterly reporting and and HUD is a very data-driven organization. So we're required to report who the funding is going to, uh, whatever data we can provide them, they'll take. But we have to first, first and foremost, make sure the money is going to the population it was intended to serve. I think that's great, that's important, thanks. Great. Any other comments, questions before we open it up to the public? Okay, this is a public hearing, uh, so if anyone um, in the audience would like to make a comment, ask a question, um, or make any other statement, please uh, indicate so by, um, how, how do they indicate, Devin? You raise their hand? Yep, so they would raise, use the hand raise button or uh, feel free to chat me. Uh, directly, and then I would just promote them to a to a panelist role. Okay. Are you receiving any interest in uh, making a comment? I have not yet received interest, um, but any, any other discussion from the board while we're waiting to see if the public uh, would like to chime in? So maybe this question was answered already, but who is uh, determining the eligibility? Um, is it town staff or is this really done, done primarily from the uh, external organizations, the Brookline Center? So in the case for block grant funds, the center does all the, they do all the intakes and they do all the verification. They maintain files and, and periodically we have to monitor them to make sure the money was going to the intended recipient, but they're on the front lines dealing with the intakes and, 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 uh, and making sure that the funding is going to who it's supposed to go to. And, from, and we're just, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. So we're just, we are an administrator of the funds. They, do the frontline work, maintain all the files, and we, over the course of the year, meet with them periodically to be sure the program's being run as it was intended to run. They're making the decisions about who the funding is going to. So what percentage of our $75,000 is going to the administrative purposes that you mentioned earlier, They're staffing the uh, telephone lines, et cetera? Right, so of that 75, it's a $45,000 administrative $30,000 direct services split. And the reason for that, um, again, it's it's a down payment. It's to build the capacity for an expected allocation later. So when that additional $800,000 is 
whatever portion makes its way to the safety net program, they're up and running and they can they can get that money out the door as quickly as possible. Right. I'll, I'll just say, yeah. Yep. I'll, I'll just say, I think, yeah, I think it's important to, um, uh, to provide services as fast as possible. And I'm convinced that the quickest way to do that is to go to an existing organization that already is interacting with folks um, and has the, the knowledge and the capability to provide services. It's a, it's a lot more difficult to uh, try and get money out the door to those in need while figuring out uh, how to disperse it, the criteria by which to judge need uh, and to do the oversight. So I think, um, and we had this conversation a few weeks ago when we first talked about this, but giving the money to the um, to the community mental health center is the is the right way to go. It's, uh, it, it fills the need in the fastest way possible um, and gets it into the hands of those who, who really need some assistance at this difficult time. All right, good point. And we're lucky that we have two institute, two, uh, two charities that are credible, reputable, and uh, can get the job done efficiently. So, Devin, anyone uh, in the public interested in chiming in? Not at this time. Okay. So, um, no, if I can say one thing um, before um, before we take a vote on this, uh, is that um, we're working currently on Monday, I believe it's going to be probably 1130 or noon, um, on doing a virtual town hall um, with, uh, with Frank and Ian, uh, who Joe mentioned earlier, uh, and others from the Brookline Community Foundation, the Brookline Center, uh, and, um, and, and incorporating the town as part of this too, to talk more about, um, to tell some of the really great stories about the folks that have been helped already um, through the generosity of um, of individuals as well as the, the actions that that we're taking as a board uh, and to also you know answer questions things of that nature and just generally help promote this as a resource um, so when I have that information I'll make sure I share it with everybody great thank you got it okay unless there is any comments from the uh, public uh, I will move approval of, first of all, a substantial amendment to the town's fiscal year 2020 annual action plan in support of the Brookline Community Mental Health Center's safety net program. All in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? Did you hear me? Yeah, uh, I'll take that as an aye. Aye. Uh, Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Ms. Fernandez? Aye. Her votes aye. Uh, move approval of the authorization transfer of funds between fiscal year 2020 CDBG accounts uh, as indicated in our agenda in the amount of $75,000. Uh, all in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? Aye. Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Uh, Fernandez? Aye. And chair votes aye. Move approval of authorizing the Director of Planning and Community Development or her designee to execute administrative and programmatic documents needed to complete a substantial amendment and transfer of funds. Uh, all in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? Aye. Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Fernandez? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Next, move approval of approving and authorizing the chair or his designee to execute a contract between the town and the Brookline Center for Community Mental Health for the safety net program. All in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? Aye. Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Fernandez? Aye. And chair votes aye. Of approval of the question of approving and authorizing the chair or his designee to execute a contract between the town and the Brookline Community Foundation for the Brookline Safety Net Fund. All in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? Aye. Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Fernandez? Aye. And chair votes aye. So we've gone through those five and let's get off or let's uh, get moving to help people who are really in need of help during this uh, COVID uh, crisis. Next, uh, noise bylaw waiver. 
again a public hearing. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, you may notice that the public hearing is scheduled for 630. So uh, we have 15 minutes and uh, maybe rather than um, just try to fill it in with updates, uh, is it possible we could move to some of the issues under under number eight or is that going to take too long? There were a couple other matters as you as you recall that you were going to raise under mitigation activities as well. So maybe you could do that now. Those are the two right. matters that yeah, came up. So um, the, the two items that I think everyone has um, received the materials uh, have to do with the uh, fees that uh, delivery services are charging to restaurants who are making deliveries to people who are uh, bunkered down in their homes. Um, and, you know, the, the thought here is that we would uh, prepare an order of the select board to be voting next week um, along the lines of the Somerville uh, ordinance uh, to address this issue. Um, I assume that uh, you know it would be based on you know, uh, having our um, staff people uh, determining um, the position of the Chamber of Commerce and, and whether there are any other issues uh, that we need to um, consider before we uh, take this action. But um, is there any uh, discussion regarding uh, this this proposal, which uh, I suggest that uh, maybe Mr. Kleckner or maybe I, I, me or one other or another board member can put together a draft for voting for a vote by the board next week. So it's my understanding that we're talking about delivery services from um, uh, delivery fees from services like Grubhub or Uber Eats, these, um, these services that hire independent contractors and serve multiple restaurants. Uh, and the, the, the action that you're contemplating is that we send an order limiting the, the amount of those fees. Um, is, that, is that correct? Correct, correct. Well, if, if the fees are that as high as uh, you know, have been indicated, I, I think it is appropriate to look at it because the restaurants are hurting and uh, it's a time time when everyone um, needs to, you know, um, step up to the plate. So it, yeah. it may, it, I, I think we should, I think we should look at it and devise our own, uh, see what, see what the situation here is in Brookline and our, are the delivery services here charging um, what they are in other communities? We just don't know that right now. So yeah. we should know it. We should know the facts and then and then work on a, uh, right. our, our position about it. So what I'm suggesting is that you know, staff uh, compile that information and present it to the board and we uh, put together a proposal that we'd vote on next week. Is that going to work, Mr. Kleckner? Yes. Okay. So um, I just have a few questions that I would like addressed, um, you know, in the proposal for next week. Um, I, in town meeting, whenever a warrant affects businesses, we've found that some of the petitioners do a very good job of alerting businesses that are going to be impacted by the warrant article. Uh, and then some warrant article petitioners do not. Um, and I see this as a potential here that we should really notify the businesses that are going to be impacted. And by businesses, I actually mean Grubhub um, and some of the other delivery service providers. Um, I think that it will be worthwhile to hear from them as to why they're charging what they're charging. Uh, because what I don't want to have happen is for us to pass something and then for it not to be economical for them to be able to keep providing the service. And then we have a problem down the road where, you know, people can't get delivery. Um, so uh, just want some reassurance that the companies that we're talking about have the opportunity to um, to weigh in. Yeah, no, I think I think that was the idea. That's a very important point, um, Ms. Hamilton. I think the idea was that uh, staff would um, work both with the Chamber of Commerce and I assume reach out to the grub hubs and other delivery services you know, to make sure that they, their views um, and, and um, the details of their uh, fees and, and contracts uh, are, are, are 
made known to the select board before we act. But yeah. You know, Thank you. Well, just to add at this point that um, I, I'm certainly not endorsing a, a 30 percent fee from a, a private um, uh, delivery service on a restaurant. But um, I just want to inject into the conversation that um, essentially what some of these restaurant uh, delivery services are allowing restaurants to do is uh, not have to hire a full time employee, um, which comes with some responsibilities, including uh, insurance and um, um, and uh, and other uh, other things that come with being an employee. And um, there, it's been widely reported, particularly in the in the transportation uh, industry, with uh, transportation demand uh, management companies around um, some of the, the practices uh, and the disadvantages of having independent contractors. And I think we just need to balance the two, um, whether we want to um, whether we want to put our, our, our finger on the scale and maybe uh, try and encourage or explore whether it's feasible to have uh, employees hired by restaurants as opposed to uh, promoting um, or advantaging these uh, these private delivery services. Um, the other, um, the sorry, other question, you know, one of the other questions I have, and I have no idea whether you know this is in effect or not, but do the restaurants pass these fees on to um, the people who are receiving the food? Uh, so I, I don't know if they do or not. Uh, apparently in Somerville or another community, they may not, but maybe they do it here. I don't know. Uh, but I do know when I order from um, um, a recent order from a grocery, it was, uh, Instacart was the deliverer, and uh, there was a, a tip that was charged. Uh, so, uh, you know, while they say it's free delivery, it's not really free delivery. There is a tip, which is appropriate, frankly. But uh, uh, so I don't know how that works. Uh, I'm also interested, uh, you know, I, you know, one of the things too is, is whenever you see that there's free delivery on, on one of these apps, know that someone is paying for that. It mm -hmm. might not be you, but someone is certainly paying that fee. Um, you know, I think we've got a, as much information as we can get, everything we've been asked for so far is going to be really important to think about some of the unintended consequences of, uh, of this. Some of these delivery companies might decide it's not, pro it's not worth worth it to be in business with some of our some of our small businesses that we love for instance so we really got to think this one through and um if there's any um information on the the conversation that took place i think i don't know if that was somerville or cambridge that we received that information about um uh but if there was any information there it looks like cambridge actually uh it, it, that we can learn from before we make a decision here i think that'd be really helpful uh and i will the other the other question i had was uh, is this within our power all along? Uh, you know, is this a, is this a very specific COVID-related power that we're that we're we're contemplating using right now? Or if COVID wasn't here or some point in the future, is this is this something within our power anyway to limit these kinds of um, yeah. of these? So, well, that's that, yeah, that's another question that we have to address. I mean, uh, Summer, uh, not Somerville, uh, Cambridge is a city. So the city council is the legislative body and can do things that uh, maybe the select board in the town cannot. So that's another issue that we have to um, you know, get some input on uh, before we make a move on this. And, and maybe uh, doing this next week is a little too ambitious. So, but I think you know all the questions that have been raised and others uh, need to be answered before we uh, decide to move forward on this. So next week, if possible, if not, you know, when, when, when we're ready. But it is an issue that has been brought to our attention by uh, local business people. And I think it's uh, incumbent upon us to at least look at uh, whether we uh, should step in and, and help them out uh, or address this issue in some way. So, I, uh, so uh, um, Mel, uh, your staff has uh, some homework on this. Um, if uh, they need any help, let me know. And, and you know, if I can, you know, uh, do some of the research, uh, I'll, I'll do that. But I think you know, it involves um, um, maybe Kara Bruton um, and town council in terms of the legal authority of the select board to do something like this, at least. 
Yes, yeah, we'll, we'll be doing that homework for next week. Right. Okay. Good. Okay, so that's really all we need to do in terms of, of that uh, item because uh, it, it was on, it was brought up in terms of um, you know, preparing for a future date when we would uh, actually have a vote on something uh, if, if it's determined that, that that's appropriate. So it's um, 627. We can chit chat a couple minutes and then get to our next uh, hearing. Any, any uh, comments that uh, select board members have on anything else? There, there was that one other matter, uh, Mr. Chair, about the uh, letter from the uh, uh, Brookline uh, Police Union. Uh, yeah. But now it's uh, pretty close to 6.30, but um, you know, so it's up to you whether you want to take that up now or later. Well, I don't know. Actually, uh, this probably wouldn't, wouldn't take that long. Maybe we should just get this out of the way right now. And uh, the hearing will be, you know, five minutes uh, late. So is that okay with other people? Okay. Um, so a letter from the, um, uh, which union was this? Uh, union of uh, First Responders regarding a, uh, a bill before the legislature that would uh, create a presumption that uh, a uh, first responder who contracts the um, COVID virus, COVID-19 virus, um, obtained that or uh, contracted that virus from uh, their work setting. So the presumption is, is that it's work related. Uh, this is similar to similar uh, to other presumptions related to um, uh, firefighters, for example, contracting uh, cancer is presumed to be work related. And uh, I think there are a number of other presumptions uh, in the law that you know, do cost the town um, a not insignificant amount of money, but are a type of um, provisions in the law that are intended to help um, our first responders who are um, facing uh, great danger, both uh, you know, physical danger as well as uh, health-related danger uh, in their jobs. So, um, Mr. Clarkner, do you want to add anything? Um, no, other than to say we were aware of this uh, legislation, um, and I made the, the decision, you know, not to um, Certainly not to oppose it, uh, but I, I didn't. I didn't bring it up to the board. I, I don't. I note that the Massachusetts Municipal Association uh, has formally uh, voted to oppose that, but that's not a big surprise because uh, you know they're always opposing uh, mandated programs. Um, but uh, you know, at this time, with the first responders doing what they're doing, um, I'm certainly not uh, suggesting we oppose the bill. Uh, I think it will pass, and. Um, Probably appropriately so. So what what's the practical difference between uh, today what happens and what uh, would happen with, if this bill were to pass? Does it just allow uh, first responders access to their sick time? What's yes, I believe so. Um, I you know I do need to do more research, and so I know uh, we're not taking any position necessarily this evening, but I need to do some more research. But I think that's the issue. So in Massachusetts uh, police officers and firefighters are not part of the workers' compensation program. They're part of a, a state system called, uh, well, we short short uh, word for 111F, which is the section of the law that it relates to. And um, uh, so it, it provides tax-free income and uh, other benefits uh, uh, other than workers' compensation. <clears throat> So, uh, we, uh, I guess, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, go we, ahead. Uh, you know, this is, a, what is the right thing to do? And I, it seems to me that the right thing to do is to make sure that the people who are working so hard for us and taking care of us and responding to our needs and taking us to the hospital if we need to be or whatever, you know, they should be protected in case something happens to them. And uh, it reminds me of 9-11 when we did protect first responders, and especially in New York, uh, at the at the uh, uh, marathon bombing, so uh, and also the marathon bombing here. I mean, we should be, you know, this is this just to me uh, the right thing to do is to support this. So yeah. I'll just say that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and you know, Brookline uh, always supports its first responders. So this is not as if uh, this is something that. Um, you know, they should be concerned with in, in general terms. And, and I think it's appropriate for us to, 
support them by um, our advocacy for this bill in the legislature. But, um, you know, that's something that um, um, you know, we need to do further uh, research on in terms of just making sure that uh, the way that we advocate is, is uh, effective. Um, and, and, and appropriate. So, uh, Mr. Kleckner, um, I guess someone needs to prepare, first of all, do any research necessary, but then prepare uh, the, le the uh, letter to the um, legislators that we are being asked to by the uh, Brookline Police Association. Is that something that uh, board members should take up or Start out. Any board member would like to do would like to do that, and receive whatever um, you know research and other information that Mr. Beckman is able to pull together. I'm happy to do it if if you need a volunteer. Okay, Franco, great. So um, I want to chime in on this issue if I get a chance. Um, sure. And and that is in addition, I'll associate myself with. Um, was Heller's comments. Uh, but in addition, I think it's it's not just about first responders. We're calling on a lot of town staff to, to show up. And um, there are some that can work from home, uh, but there are many others um, that because of their job are required to actually interact and engage with either one another or members of the public. Um, I put in a request very late this afternoon, so I don't expect a response yet, um, but to, to understand um, what our sick leave policy is, um, and for us to maybe have a conversation about it if we need to um, related to if any one of our of our staff that are being asked to come in uh, for their duties um, acquire COVID in any way shape or form whether or not um, any sick time that they would take would count against um, what they have in their allotment right now um, I certainly think it shouldn't uh, because you know we're, we're asking them to come in and be essential and do this work uh, and uh, so, um, so I'm anxious to hear back about that in the coming days uh, and, and maybe that's something that we can take up as well if we need to. Great. Okay. Is that something that um, if someone can pull together, um, Mr. Kleckner? I will. We will. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, we'll we'll take that up uh, hopefully next week. And um, right now, move on to our 6:30 hearing. Uh, question of approving the noise bylaw waiver um, for the installation of a test well as part of the construction on the Michael Driscoll School on May 2nd to May 4th of uh, this year. Um, any uh, information we need to to be added to what's in our packet? Uh, well, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Tony Grigley is here, who's the project manager, um, town's uh, project manager on this project, and can uh, answer any questions you have. I believe this is pre-construction. This is, uh, uh, you know, doing certain uh, tests that will help inform the, the uh, final design. Yes, good evening. This is Tony Quigley with the building department. Um, uh, this indeed is part of the uh, pre-construction activities. Uh, right now we're heavily engaged in uh, uh, determining existing conditions uh, out at the building and uh, this test well is for the planned geothermal uh, system to heat and cool the building as part of the uh, this particular project's approach to the fossil fuel uh, directive for the building. And uh, this test well is currently being drilled now. Uh, they started it yesterday. I wasn't able to get out there today because I was at the water garage most of the day for other issues, but I was there, but I understand they're making good progress. And at the end of the drilling of this test well, uh, the well has to actually cool off for a week, and then uh, we need to run uh, a fluid through the well, uh, pump it through for 48 continuous hours in order to um, uh, gain information as to uh, that would inform the design, the number of wells that we'll need, how deep they're gonna be, et cetera, et cetera. So the uh, noise bylaw waiver request uh, applies actually to that 48 hour period, which is planned to begin at 8 a.m. on May 2nd and be complete at 8 a.m. on May 4th. And again, it's uh, uh, 
it's you have to run the uh, liquid through the uh, test well for 48 hours continuous to be able to gather data. Is this a loud process? I, I, running water through a well. I mean, it, I guess no. I it's what, it's what the generator. There. It's the generator. So we have to power the pump okay, with the right. generator. Normal. You know, I asked the question. Well, why can't we just plug it into the building? No, it has to be a um, a a very pure form of power, continuous and uninterrupted, that is provided by a generator. So this is actually for the generator. Oh, it's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Do you know how loud it will be? I mean, is it like is it like the backup uh, lights on a truck, but backup noise on a truck, or is it like uh, you know? or a jackhammer or is it just sort of a, a steady kind of noise that it's a gonna... steady it's a steady kind of noise and from the information that i received it's um 65 decibels at 23 feet the nearest house is much further than 23 feet away and just for comparison an air conditioner at 20 feet is 60 decibels and if you're traveling in your car at 60 miles an hour with the window inside that car is 70 decibels so it's not really i don't expect it to be loud the reason we're requesting the noise by law waiver is because it's for after outside of the normal construction hours of uh 7 a.m to 7 p.m so uh, just because of that we need to uh request uh the why the noise by law waiver but i don't i don't think people are actually going to notice it to be honest with you well, are the, uh, okay, are, are the uh, those on who are running the test prepared to kind of to try to muffle it if it gets too loud? Uh, I will ask them to do that if it gets too loud. Be prepared to do that, but I don't. Uh, again, it's uh, 65 dB at 23 feet. The nearest house is way further than 23 feet. I mean, it's okay. way across the soccer field and. Then across uh, uh, Washington Street would be the nearest house, so far away. And, and I assume that the the uh, butters, so-called the butters, are have been notified of this. They have been notified, and we received uh, one question which we answered. And um, uh, you know, uh, we've really tried to reach out to butters on everything on this project, and yeah. Uh, uh, you know, people have been very supportive and uh, very, very good questions uh, on this and other issues. And so, yes, we did send out a mailing to the butters and with a lot of information on this. And uh, uh, as I said, the actual well is being drilled now. I've seen some of the pictures. I've seen some of the pictures. It's quite exciting. It is. It's very exciting. Actually, I've never been involved in a geothermal project. So it's uh, personally, for me, very exciting. And uh, I can tell you that um, we're going to try and unturn every stone we can to determine, uh, not just on this is issue, uh, existing conditions, you know, to inform the design as much as possible and avoid change orders, which, um, so we're heavily into that. And uh, we're going to be doing some uh, testing inside the building at the end of the month for uh, materials testing. We're going to be opening up walls and what have you. Uh, while there's no school in session. So uh, the downside of the COVID thing, obviously, is, you know, that's that's well known, but the upside is we can get in there and do things that give us enough time to try and uh, determine existing conditions. Tony, we're also getting a question from a member of the public about the um, fact that the, some condos and apartments on Westbourne may, may not be as far as the houses. So uh, do you know how far those condos and apartments are? Um, they're closer the, where the generator will sit in those um, condos on Westbourne. I see. So the, at the, so the physical presence of the building will help to muffle that sound? Yes, because the, it's going in the corner of the building where the, where the entry to the gym is. So uh, the building's actually in between where the generator is and the uh, buildings on Westbourne. Okay. Thanks. Now, if, if I could say just a few words about this particular issue, I am co-chair of the, uh, of the 
uh, Driscoll School Building Committee and sat in on the interviews for the construction manage manager firms. And the firm that we went with had a really great interview because they were able to articulate a very good plan for the geothermal wells um, and how they were going to try to mitigate, you know, the impact on the neighborhood. And they went into detail about, you know, in doing a test well, what is it that you're trying to find out? Of course, you're trying to find out whether or not it'll work. But the information that you're going to glean is how far down can you realistically go? Because that will determine the number of wells needed. So if you can't go that far down, you're going to need more wells. If you can go further down, then you're going to need less wells. And all of that will dictate not only the design, but also the budget. Right. And schedule. Yes. And that was the other thing. We asked them, we asked every single firm if you could do the testing now or wait for school to let out, which one would you choose? They all said, do the testing now because it's going to dictate your schedule. Right. So um, in, in this COVID-19 era, uh, the questions that we've been getting uh, are, um, have construction workers been able to do social distance and, and uh, otherwise protect themselves from uh, the virus from other uh, workers? Um, and I assume that in, in a case like this, that's not that difficult to do and is being done. But could you um, sort of speak to that uh, for our audience? Yes, well, in this particular case, it's a very small crew. And, uh, you know, as I said, I was, on, I was, I visited them yesterday. I wasn't able to get out there today, but it seemed like they were, you know, practicing social distancing, very small crew. So there's not a lot of people and uh, the public is, um, uh, segre is, is separated from where they are by fencing. So they can't get anywhere near the workers anyways, for safety reasons, other than COVID, but also for that reason. I assume just as part of their usual construction practice, they, they have N95 masks uh, that uh, you know protect them as well as protect other others around them. I will I will visit them tomorrow and make sure that we're all set there. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like there's no alternative to uh, installing this generator. Um, it's the only way to go. Yes, we have to install a generator and run it for 48 hours uh, in order to gather the data. And uh, once the, we only have to do that once for this test well. Uh, and it's uh, the actual, you know, uh, drilling of the well is happening during normal daytime hours. So that's, we're not here for that on a noise bylaw uh, waiver request. It's just for the generator. And it's my understanding, just to go back to something that we uh, um, we talked about a moment ago, that this test well and generator are going to be installed between the playground on Washington Street and uh, Westbourne Terrace, sort of on the, the hardscape play area. Is that, is that it's in the asphalt area right outside the entry to the gyms. So the building is actually a sound buffer to the... Uh, uh, the school's actually a sound buffer to the buildings that would be up on Westbourne. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? This is a public hearing. Uh, Devin, are there any uh, members of the public that would like to speak to this issue? Sure, so we have um, one member of the public who is using the Q&A function, um, which you can find by clicking on the three dots um, next to the chat button. And um, she has asked a handful of questions, one of which Nancy addressed earlier. Um, but, you know, her question was, can the people running this test take any types of steps to muffle the sound of the generator? Um, it sounds like, you know, she feels satisfied with the answers Tony has given her at this point. Um, but, you know, if, if he wants to elaborate on that, you know, feel free, Tony. Yeah, um, there's currently we're not planning any uh, measures to it because it is only at 65 dB, which is um, not much more than a window air conditioner at 23 feet. 
and uh, the building, you know, the nearest building is much further than 23 feet away. So I, I really don't think people are gonna really even know it's there. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. All right, thank you. Any other uh, comments from the uh, public? Um, it looks like Mark Levy has raised his hand, so I'm gonna promote him. Okay. Mark? Has he been successfully promoted? He has. Mark, do I, you have a question? We lost him. Okay, looks like we've, we've lost that comment. Um, so Mark is here. He's been promoted to a panelist. Um, if he hasn't enabled his audio and video to function with um, the WebEx event, he can always type his question into the chat. Is he typing? No. Yeah. Nope, so we can always um, come back to him if he has a question for the, for the noise bylaw hearing. It doesn't look like there are any other comments at this time. Any uh, questions from the board or comments from the board? Further comments or questions? Okay, then I will move approval of the noise bylaw waiver for the installation of a test well as part of construction on the Michael Driscoll School during the period May 2 through May 4. All in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? Ms. Heller? Uh, Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Fernandez? Aye. I'm an aye. Ms. Heller, okay. I'm aye. And, and chair votes aye. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Good um, evening. Sorry, Tony, before you head out, oh. uh, Mark was able to submit his question. He okay. asked, does the sound measurement include ground transmission of low frequencies? No. Okay, no, with, with that one. Would, would that um, would that make a difference in terms of uh, the uh, obstruction between the generator and the, the houses on Westbourne? No. And, and uh, I guess the question is, um, would uh, low frequency uh, sound waves, um, you know? Uh, impact those houses even even if uh, the decibel level is relatively low relative to where they are no because i don't anticipate it's a generator that just it's brought in i don't anticipate ground trans i don't anticipate ground transmission of sound it's a okay. it's a generator that sits on a trailer hmm. okay just brought in as a you know portable generator basically right Thank you for your question, Mark. It's Mark Levy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Quigley. 
quickly. Um, next, presentation of uh, COVID-19 public health and demographic data. Tell me what this is about. I assume it's, uh, it's, it's uh, Dr. Jett's uh, demographic data uh, of um, uh, the number of cases uh, in, uh, contracted by Black, Hispanic, and Asian residents of Brookline, um, which is an issue that's uh, greatly discussed around the country, um, exposing disparities in health, uh, health outcomes from the virus and um, reflecting the underlying disparities in access to health resources uh, that exist in this country, unfortunately. But fortunately, uh, not as badly here in Massachusetts, where uh, most of well, the overwhelming majority of people are covered by health insurance, and we have uh, fairly um, excellent uh, health resources, you know, for people who um, uh, come down with various illnesses, including uh, COVID. Although um, our ability to deal with that, um, from the standpoint of the health institutions, is somewhat limited. But at any rate, uh, so is Dr. Jett available to um, present this? information yes okay so go ahead Dr. Jeff. okay so i believe what you have in your packet um is the data from last week that i presented and you know the numbers really don't show any disparities um in terms of race and ethnicity um when you look at what you see in boston where 42 percent of the cases were African American, um, that showed a high disparity. But in Brookline, our demographics um, mirrors what our population demographics is, and so it's pretty straightforward. And I do have the updated um, data, but I wasn't able to put it in this packet today. Right. <laughs> And the updated data doesn't include any uh, for any further changes in, in the basic uh, uh, picture here? No. Um, what you have is 21%, a 12% um, Asian population um, from our data has COVID. That's 21 cases. 15 cases African-American, 8%. Um, Latin, Hispanic, um, 8, 4%. Other is 17, uh, 17 cases, 10%. And the white population, we have 117 to 66%. For a total ethnicity that we can find is 178. We have a total of 212 cases in Brookline. Um, the 50 cases you don't see that's unknown in the data is because those are nursing homes. And we usually get a line listing, and they have to include that demographic data. We can't go in and interview them or call them because either they, you know, they have COVID uh, and, you know, there might be a dying situation or they're in the hospital. Right. So that information will be updated later. Right. Yeah, uh, Devin, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we hear you, Bernard. Okay, because I'm having some computer issues here, and I'm sort of crossing my fingers that it doesn't um, crash, so... Um, Okay, uh, any uh, further discussion of this? Yes, uh, question for, for Dr. Jett. Are we in a position now as we, um, as we update on our COVID-19 website uh, the, the, the new total number of cases, uh, are we in a position to continuously update uh, the, the chart that you gave us based on race? And are there any other um, demographic factors like age or maybe other factors I'm not thinking of that might be helpful to include as part of that too. Yeah, so, um, you know, as I explained, I, and I know you probably new to this, so it's one you don't know about, but, you know, I've requested an epidemiologist for some time now besides myself. So, you know, I'm tracking down issues at Wingate, Care One, Star Market, um, and the numerous amount of emails I have. So to, to do the actual data analysis, takes quite a bit of time, uh, but that's my hope. Um, I was going to hire another epidemiologist on the outside, but I have to de-identify the data from Maven uh, because, you know, it's, it's HIPAA violation. So I have to take out the addresses, 
things that I can identify from. But that's one of the key things I look to move to do. And hopefully when I get some time in the next week to add age, but also show graphic information in terms of what has happened from the beginning. And so you can begin to see how we peak, um, which we don't have a curve. So I don't want people to think we flatten the curve because Right now, we're running almost in a straight line with just a slow movement up a hill. Um, so over time, hopefully, you know, I've gotten better in trying to spare time and do this. But it does take the, our data set is, you know, you can imagine how big it is, even though it only shows 212 cases, but it has you know, address information, age, birth, et cetera. So the spreadsheet is, you know, not that simple in order to deal with. Right. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm thinking if we, even if we can get, I mean, um, and maybe I, I don't know, because I'm, I'm, I'm new to this, but uh, I'm thinking we'd be able to get someone of any rank, frankly, that would be able to just say, we've got, when we, because we're reporting, let's say, 20 new cases, we add that to the total number, presumably we either have or don't have their race and their age, um, and then it would just take somebody updating the chart that already exists with race. And if we added an age column, updating stats in those charts. Is yeah, it I already have the chart updated. I already have the chart updated for race. It just didn't make it in. Right. Race in the district didn't make it in today. Yeah. I guess my question is, can we get to a position where we're updating that daily, if not weekly? I mean, I'd prefer it to be updated daily as we update all the other stats, but if not, uh, you know, what can we expect in terms of so, you know, with the public? Yeah, so my goal is to update each Friday. So I presented this the previous Friday. So now it's Monday or Tuesday. So this is the update. Um, but our end is so small, you won't see the significant differences that you're looking for. Um, because our cases is not that high. Um, so in order for our end to really change, in order for you to see some demographic information, you'll probably need to add almost 100 new cases. And I don't think we would reach that before this is over. I, Dr. I Jett, not. Oh, yeah. select board members, uh, while this item was not a public hearing, you do have a couple of questions. So I'll just defer to you about when and if you want to take them. To me? Uh, yes, the first question is from John Van Skoyak asking about the uh, total number of cases for CARE 1 on Park Street. And the second question that we have in the queue is from Deborah Brown um, asking, do we have age and location data? Why the high unknown data? It would change your conclusions. So age and location data, well, I wouldn't give up the location because that would be a HIPAA violation. Um, I, I have what I can provide is a, a map of proximity of all the cases, which we do have that, but I would not dial into specific location. Um, in terms of care one, um, I would give an approximate, we have approximately 50 cases. That includes um, people living there as well as staff. By the way, uh, I apologize. My uh, computer crashed for a second. I, I was able to get back. Um, I have uh, bandwidth problems here, and which I think everyone in Brookline um, with uh, Comcast probably has. But um, and, anyway, and so, I'm back. Yeah, and so, Devin, to finish that question, you know, given up the location in Brookline, it is such dense uh, population size. If I gave up an address or a specific area, you could pretty much know who it is. So I, I'm not willing to do that and compromise somebody's um, safety. What was the number? Um, for care one? Approximately 50 cases. Five zero. Thank you. Yes. And 50 cases uh, referring to what? 50 what, cases what are referring to care one. Care one, okay. That I was offline for a few minutes. All right. Dr. Jett, is that one location or multiple locations? No, that's one location. Uh, how many uh, residents uh, are we talking about at Care One? 99. So 50 out of 99. 
pretty high. Yeah, here. well, so that's 99 residents, but they also have 144 workers. And some of those are workers that have tested positive. So today oh. they have 12 workers that have tested positive out of 50. So if you're looking at probably two thirds, you know, that have COVID there, but they have it on different floors. So the people that do have, that are symptomatic, do have COVID, uh, they're on one floor, and the people that are asymptomatic don't have COVID, they're on another floor. But keep in mind, too, they also are taking in new admissions from the hospital. So people that do have COVID in a hospital are now being admitted back to the nursing facility, which mm -hmm. isn't the ideal situation, but that is what's going on at this time. Yeah. Dr. Jett, just to be clear, the, the 12 employees, would they be counted in our numbers or they counted where they live? They counted in our numbers because I'm tracking the facility because that's where the outbreak occurred. Got it. So when we see that total, the total numbers on our COVID website, it would include those folks, even though they may not live in Brookline. So well, let, me, let me correct that. So okay. the residents that live there, they would be included in them, but not the employees. Okay, got it. Because I don't get a, I get, I don't get a line listing, and we don't put them in Maple. It's been widely reported that the National Guard is doing some testing. I, I assume that you're uh, in communication with the state, and um, if appropriate, the National Guard is paying visits to Care One and other senior facilities. In so on the ground, um, what takes a chunk of my time, and I do the best I can. Um, when an outbreak in, in first occurs. I contact the facility and I provide them with all the documentation and then we create the cluster here and we alert the state. Um, from that time period, me and the state, we in liaison with the entity. So CARE 1, I had a conference call with them on Friday because of some of the concerns that was brought by the citizens and they actually had MGH come in and do an infection control follow-up to make sure they was following the proper procedure. And they came back with a clean bill of health saying they were doing everything appropriate. Um, they were following the proper um, how to don PPE um, when they left the facility, when they entered the facility, how they separated the patients, um, and how they followed the protocols in terms of sanitation. So that is ongoing. Um, initially, I give them all the resources if they need to call the National Guard. It's listed in the email. The email is quite lengthy. I'm going to get about five documents, and they have called National Guard twice to do testing. Initially, National Guard just did testing on symptomatic, but since then, they have spread to do asymptomatic as well. And so that might be the reason you have more cases there, because they have did a second round of testing. Dr. Jett, earlier today, the governor, um, during his press conference, um, mentioned uh, that um, there were test kits going out to nursing homes, and I think they had sent out 14,000 test kits, but only 4,000 of them were returned, and that they were reevaluating um, the whole testing process related to nursing homes. Is there, um, and there wasn't a whole lot of information about what the issue was there. Is, do you have any insight into, into what the problems are in terms of, of getting tested? I mean, th this was, I'm, I'm a little alarmed by what's happening at CARE 1 right now. Um, and I want to make sure that um, that if you know if kits are available, that they're getting there, so we can find out the extent um, to which the problem may be spreading in, in nursing homes. Well, Care One has probably done the best um, testing than anybody else, and so you know I'm fairly comfortable with what they have done today. Um, that's not to say other people haven't done due diligence, but you know I have been with Care One since day one. Um, Got it is another place that has done quite well. But the mere fact that MGH came in and assisted them um, bodes well, and they, and they said they had no issues with their operation. Now, in terms of the test kits, initially, um, CARE 1 did ask for some more swabs. They were provided with that initially. But you can imagine, in some of these nursing homes, they just don't have the staff to do the testing. CARE 1, Wingate, Garter, they are not in that queue. Uh, with that type of issue. But other communities don't have the staffing model. So one of the things I've tried to work with each one of the nursing facilities or assisted living is to say, make sure you separate the staff that is sick, the staff that has worked with the individuals that have been sick, and may, they have to stay there. 
the staff that have worked with the individuals that are healthy, they have to stay there. And so that kept them from cross-contaminating each other. And so um, I think, you know, that has happened at CARE 1. And so I'm not as alarmed. The, the only part that alarms me with CARE 1 is that they are allowing new admission. But remember, the health department and no jurisdiction has oversight over nursing homes, only the state. So what we're providing is an additional service outside the realm of what we normally would do. We normally would just, if it's just one case, they have no survivors, we will follow that. But to the extent of what I'm doing and what Barbara is doing and implement data, that normally doesn't happen. But I will assure you in the future, I think that's a model, even though, you know, we might be facing a budget deficit. But I think in the future, the health department needs to have some capacity on ground in order to monitor these facilities in the future. Because this is a gap that, perfectly honest, it does scare me, makes me leery. But I think we need to have a better grasp on it. It, it shouldn't be your director of health monitoring these facilities. We need to staff infrastructure from the environmental to EPI to somebody doing the inspection with them, whether it be a nurse, et cetera, to give them all the protocols and make sure there's not one death, but also to make sure we have some type of step-down facility available. So once you identify that there's an outbreak in a facility, you have the ability to move people immediately. And that's one of the problems that we have with nursing homes. We have no place to move people. So now, the longer they sit in this day in the incubation, they in a facility, it's just the amount of time that everybody's going to test positive. So that's, that's just my thought. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Jett. Uh, even though I missed a couple of minutes of uh, your uh, response, um, you know, you've given us a lot of things to think about, both in terms of um, you know, staffing of your department as well as you know the, the frightening nature of what we're facing, particularly as it relates to the elderly. Thank you, thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so there's something in our packet uh, regarding um, contact tracing through a digital uh, platform. Um, Someone explain that to me, what, what what this is about. So I'm going to, this is a collaboration that I have that I want to present something to Brookline. And so I'm going to let Dr. Nate Willis talk about it because he's been at the forefront, um, not only in Massachusetts, but in the nation. And a lot of articles has been written about this in the New York Times, but we remain anonymous as, as, as much as possible uh, anonymous. So uh, Dr. Nate, if Devin, you can turn over the mic to him so he can do the presentation. What, what's his last name? Willis. Willis, okay. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's Dr. Nate, Nate, Nate Horwitz Willis. Okay, tell us about this uh, COVID safe pass. Yeah, thank you all for um, having me here this evening. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, thank you. Um, and so can you all see my screen currently right now? Yes. All right. So essentially as Dr. Okay, great. Essentially as Dr. Jet was saying, um, there's been a lot of work done in Massachusetts in regards to contact tracing and getting ahead of COVID-19. And what we're doing now is we're trying to advance beyond it here in Massachusetts and we're using an equitable and inclusive, and also a very effective public health contact tracing approach. Um, and I do wanna just say that being here is actually um, very significant because my colleague and I, um, Dr. Susan Garfield, we thought about who should we come and approach this with um, and bring it to in terms of our local communities to make local public health that much more effective. And we thought about Brookline and the reasons that you see here is because you all are very thoughtful and you all are very forward thinking. Um, you have a very dynamic commissioner of uh, Brookline Health and Human Services. And also the, the um, residents, they tend to want to advocate for equity and inclusion. And when you're talking about dealing with COVID, um, you have different groups of people um, you know, that have different ideas and you want to try to help 
public health system that incorporates all of that. And you want to have a good and effective system that takes that into consideration. And really, you know, when I'm talking about contact tracing and talking about this technology, it's very sophisticated. Um, and we live in, we're living in the 21st century, and a lot of people are wondering, why are we staying at home? Why is this taking so long? And using this technology, really, um, the purpose of it is to enable us to open back up our local economies um, and to use it in such a way that it's going to benefit the community and it's going to make public health department that much more effective to capitalize on those benefits for the public and for businesses. I mean, being here and listening to you all talk, you know, about the community and the challenges that you're facing, this technology is aiming to resolve that. So when we talk about contact tracing, we have the traditional method, and then we have the contact tracing of now. And the traditional method of contact tracing, it really is struggling to take into consideration how to keep pace with an infectious disease such as the coronavirus or also called SARS-CoV-2 that leads to COVID as a diagnosis. So when we first learned about coronavirus, we had this thing called the r naught in infectious disease when we talk about epidemiology. When you talk about the r naught being at around two or three, you're referring to the, the spread of it being fast. And one is usually like the reference value. So the flu, if you can think of it, usually has an r naught between one and a half to two. Um, the literature when it first came out said coronavirus had an r naught close to three, now it's close to five. Um, we don't know what the r naught could be in the future as this virus starts to slowly mutate. And the reason why I talk about the r naught and contact tracing is because when people are doing this in the traditional method, making phone calls, doing all this manual data entry and trying to keep it up with all, all this data, as Dr. Jett has said, he, he, he needs all, this, all these epidemiologists, all the staff, and um, I'm not debating that. But in times like this, this is an opportune time to leverage technology to get ahead so that way you don't face issues such as generating health inequities or you're not facing issues with not understanding how your information systems are interacting with each other. Because as it stands currently right now, some of our systems in the public health world have a tough time trying to talk to one another. And when people are trying to enter information, we are prone to error because we are human. So doing the traditional method presents a lot of challenges, primarily because of the rate of infection or the rate of transmission among these types of infectious diseases that are starting to emerge now. So when we talk about the contact tracing of now, we're really trying to talk about how do we match up with public health policy with the most effective solutions coupled with technology, right? So as I've explained earlier, the r naught, this technology takes in consideration of the r naught. Um, so when we talk about using this technology, we are talking about using cell phone based technology. So the beautiful thing about this um, here in America is that we learn from a lot of mistakes, and a lot of faults from other people using cell phone based technology. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, my gosh, this is going to be like China. Oh, my gosh, this is going to bug me and give me all these types of alerts. Uh, that's not the case at all. Um, and then we have heard people say, oh, my goodness, my privacy, my privacy. Um, yes, we do struggle with issues of privacy here in America or around the globe for that matter, but the technology, as my colleague Dr. Garfield will talk about, is built into where it allows individuals to not be tracked, it allows individuals to not receive all these bogus alerts, but mo most importantly, it allows individuals like Dr. Jett and you all as a select board to have this oversight of how does this look? How, do, how can we look at things geospatially? Because I did see individuals talk about locations. Well, we're not talking about locations in terms of finding out where does Peter live or where does you know Paul live at. This is more or less about where are people going and how can we get them to be on a safe path to get into a safe place, hence the naming convention of this type of technology. So that's what we're geared on. We're really wanting to get all people resources and opportunity to have the best chance at success while giving the public health department that authority to be able to work with folks you know, who are saying like, hey, I need to go to the grocery store or I want to go to the park, but I don't know what my level, you know, or of risk could be if I go somewhere. Or you say that, hey, I'm a COVID positive individual and I want to contribute and help people understand my location history, but it's controlled by the public health department to where you can control it and work with the public and you're forward facing. So it's really, you know, an advanced technology that takes into consideration the disease patterns and it couples it by putting that information out to the public and no one is going to be exposed at all. So this, for the first time in the history of, of local public health, um, would give you all the opportunity 
to say we are getting ahead and we are planning for a mitigation. Yes, a mitigation strategy, but most importantly, a sustainment strategy with the contact tracing of now in a very equitable approach. So without further ado, I want to pass this over to my colleague, um, Dr. Susan Garfield. Now. Good evening, everyone, and, and Nate, you can move right on to the next slide. So to be clear, what we're talking about is two tools, one for the public health department um, to help aid in the tracking process. Um, right now, as, as Dr. Horowitz Willis was just saying, um, the tracing is a very manual process. It, it involves having a phone call with an individual, relying on their memory of where they were, when they were, um, how long they were there. And you can imagine for all of us, when you're sick, it's even harder to have, have proper recall. So this process today is um, quite inaccurate and also very time consuming for the public health professionals like Dr. Jett to complete. So if you go to the next slide, um, what we've developed through an, a, a public health initiative that was founded out of MIT um, and now is supported by volunteer participants from academia, public health, um, the Mayo Clinic. Um, it's informed by folks um, in the World Health Organization, Health and Human Services. So it's an all volunteer initiative that has created a tool to help enable the public health workers to do automatic, automated contact tracing. So an individual can download their location history from their phone and then upload it to the public health tracer um, in a completely private, um, non-personally identifiable way. So at the core of this solution, um, one of the things we want you to understand is that it is 100% privacy driven. Um, individuals have 100% control over their own data. Um, their tracing history never leaves their phone unless they consent to upload it to the public health um, department. Once that upload happens um, to the Safe Places um, platform, the public health person and the individual has the opportunity to have a conversation leveraging a map. And if you go to the next slide, I can show you what that looks like. So once you upload your information, um, the a map is created or your trace is created. This is an individual depiction of, of where a person has been and when they were there. Each of those dots is a timestamp to show not only when you were someplace, but how long you were there. And what you can do in that conversation is for each point, the individual has the opportunity to redact it with the public health professional. So for example, um, if Ms. Heller was, was uploading her information and she pointed to one of those dots, that's my house, that could be eliminated from the public trace um, to preserve privacy, recognizing that an individual would already be in communication with their household members um, and it doesn't represent an exposure, exposure risk to the general population. In addition, um, what, what then happens is once the individual's uh, tracing history after being redacted um, is then uploaded to a general database so that you as um, the, the town of Brookline has a full picture not only of how many people are infected, like the conversation you were just having with Dr. Jett, but where the, the, the points of risk are um, in your community. Um, and what is nice about this, um, this program and this platform, and because it's privacy preserving, once this data gets uploaded, it's completely de-identified. So you don't know who the person is, um, and they don't have to worry that they or, or, or any of their family are at personal risk from sharing information. If you go to the next slide, the second piece of this puzzle is an app that lives on our phones. Um, so this app um, called COVID Safe Paths is, um, is anybody can download it um, and we'd make people aware through media and public health education efforts. Um, you download it and it tracks your, um, your movement just in the background of your phone and that data never leaves your phone. Um, but it does interface with that collective data um, coming out of the public health department. So again, as Dr. Jett was talking about um, the number of cases in Brookline, 
Um, each one has to be contacted and, and, and then their contacts, their traces um, need to be identified. What our platform does is it automates that. So that data of where infected people have been can then get pushed out to people who have this app and say, cross-referencing the infected people's traces with an uninfected person's traces. Those two things come together and the population at large can be alerted if they're at risk. It doesn't say that you are at risk because um, you, uh, you intersected with Devin at three o'clock in the afternoon and she's sick. No, in fact, it just says you um, had an exposure today with a person who was, um, who was diagnosed with COVID. Your exposure was 15 minutes long, two and a half hours long, depending on the overlap of those traces. And then it provides specific resources for that person um, in the case of Brookline, you can have Brookline specific information, um, contact uh, Dr. Jed at the public health department. Um, here are some local um, clinics to, to get testing here in Brookline, et cetera. So you can contextualize the resources for, for the people of, of your um, city, or you can just refer to general health resources. So if you go to the next slide, um, so what we're proposing today is um, a pilot of this technology in Brookline. Um, leveraging the, the concept of privacy and data protection as at its core. Um, we'll provide these slides so you don't have to read every word, but um, going to the next slide, basically the value proposition um, is, is quite, quite tremendous. Um, th this collaboration that's built these tools are the, the greatest technical minds in our country coming from MIT, um, technology collaborators, um, We've had clinical input from the Mayo Clinic, Mass General Hospital, the World Health Organization, Health and Human Services, et cetera. And if you go to the next slide together, um, they, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, uh, yes. So um, we, we have a solution that we think provides tremendous value to both the public health community making the tracing um, process both quicker um, because you have the map as a reference point, um, more effective because you have that data as opposed to recall, um, relying on an individual's recall, and impactful because that data can then be used by the public health department and the government to really understand in greater detail the exposure risk of an individual. So you can imagine um, if you found from a, um, from a safe places enabled uh, tracing um, that if a person was in Stop and Shop or the Trader Joe's in Coolidge Corner or at the Tea Stop, that exposure history has a significantly greater impact to the population of Brookline than if the person in the two weeks prior to being diagnosed was sheltering in place at home. So this tool is very helpful for you to understand um, current, um, current disease, the impact of that spread and predict future um, outbreaks as a result. And the app itself gives individuals in Brookline a tremendous amount of knowledge and reinsurance about when they've been exposed and when they when they haven't, um, leading to help and help both opening society back up when the time is right, and also helping you and helping individuals manage um, both their exposure and their risk going forward. Let me pause there and see if there are any questions. I guess my question is, what are we being asked to do with respect to this um, this uh, system? Yeah, so um, the I, I should have mentioned that um, the, the platform, both the Safe Places tool for the public health and the Safe Path app have been developed as a humanitarian effort by this consortium. So they are being offered free of charge to many municipalities around the country and around the world. So we are um, deploying pilots um, in cities and states and countries um, free of charge, supporting both the implementation, um, training of tracers, um, as well as public health education and promotion either through the me media or other means. Um, so what we're asking for is approval of a pilot in Brookline um, to, to support the evaluation of this technology enabled track and trace um, system um, here in Brookline to look at it um, in, in comparison to a manually based program. Uh, Dr. Nate, do, do you have any additional detail in terms of the apps? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, Dr. Garfield laid that out very clearly. Um, so in terms of the pilot, the specific ask for the pilot is to 
I looked at this very carefully and cautiously with Dr. Jet um, and having that oversight of it and that we do a very slow rollout. Um, so that's the specifics on that pilot. We wouldn't release that out to the public as a pilot. We would do it in-house with him. Um, and we would select a few individuals. And if anyone from the select board would like to participate on the pilot, we would extend it out to you guys too. I guess my concern is that uh, this wasn't on the agenda as um, something for us to vote on. And, and in any event, uh, something like this uh, would have to go through a huge amount of hoops in Brookline because of uh, people's concern with respect to privacy. I know you, you've you um, uh, indicated that you think you have a, a platform that um, by architecture is, is going to uh, protect privacy. Um, but uh, you know, that that's something that uh, will be um, analyzed uh, by a number of, of uh, persons and, and committees in this town, including the surveillance committee. Um, so, but how, well, how I, are I would you think. Going to, I'm sorry. I'm just asking a question. Of, I gather that the the pilot involves having a certain number of people download the app to their phones. Is that correct? So, um, Ms. Heller, the, the pilot, so all participation is completely voluntary. The app will be available to the general public in the app store. There's nothing specific to the residents of Brookline that make them compelled in any way to download the app um, different than the general population. The pilot is really focused on supporting Dr. Jett and the public health community with the Safe Places tool which basically allows them to download a person's location history with consent and, and prior approval by that person to enable a, 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 a tracing activity um, that uses the tool. Um, that person would be having a tracing conversation with the public health department anyway. So there's nothing, there's no privacy, there's no um, extraordinary um, impact to the individuals of Brookline other than when they get infected and they have a conversation with the public health um, department about their, their tracing history, they have the choice whether or not they want to download um, their, their location history and then provide it to the public health department to create a much faster, more efficient conversation. So, so there's, there's no kind of mass deployment um, or requirement. Um, the people in Brookline would have the option, as everybody in the country will have the option to download the app and then benefit from that um, uh, tracing data that will be collected through the Safe Places tool from the Public Health Department. Again, that notification of whether or not you've been exposed, but that notification lives on an individual's phone there's no data sharing to the government, the public health department, or anybody else. So again, that's an individual choice um, to download that app. And the content of your your um, history of locate your location history is entirely on your phone and not shared with anyone unless you choose to do so at the point of um, infection and reporting. So the information that's collected is not shared with any other companies or with any other governments or uh anyone is that correct? no it is not it is not shared and also at the point when the the trace um when the location history leaves the individual's phone and goes up to um, the public health department it is de-identified and contains no personally identifiable information so the trace itself is a data file absent of any content that can be then linked back to an individual um, so it's merely the, the trace itself that then has the opportunity to get further redacted by the individual and the tracing professional um, if that the locations themselves hold any um, privacy concerns. I'd like to jump in real quick. Um, sure. and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like this would be most effective after stay at home is, is lifted and business uh, closures are ended or at least in part when people start, at least the location part, where people start moving around a lot more. Right now, it wouldn't be all too surprising if um, if one of the very few locations that are open for people to go to, someone um, you know who um, who had contracted COVID was was in that location. Let's say stop and shop. That wouldn't be too surprising. 
It's only stop and shop Trader Joe's and a few other places where you can actually go anyway. Um, that, that said, the, um, the ability to, to know that you were in proximity or close proximity to someone for X amount of time, 20 minutes, an hour again, more than likely after stay home is lifted and businesses um, start to open back up. Um, I guess my question, though, is what in order to make this uh, valuable for for the community, um, what kind of penetration do you need? Meaning what percentage of the population would you target to, to be using this um, app to, to make it um, a valid tool for us? Yep. Um, thank you for your question, Mr. Fernandez. So there's um, there's two points. So we do expect the, um, the this toolkit to have increasing value um, as society open back back up to give you early signals on where there are infections and the people that they are most likely impacting. So in your example of of stop and shop. Not everyone in Brookline is going to have been at Stop and Shop at the time when the infected individual is there. So you can really focus your interventions on those people who are exposed. Um, right now, you have no capacity to do that because current tracing has no ability to reach those people in public settings. Um, so it really ups the ability um, of, of this information to have an impact. So to your second question, um, there's, there's two tiers of value it, ha it can have. Immediately, it provides value to the public health um, department by providing more accurate, efficient um, tracking tools. So instead of an individual having a conversation with an individual based on memory, you have this map of where someone's been and the times that they were there. So it's, it's, an, it's a much more accurate trace. That has independent value. When you start talking about the app, and how many people have to download it for you to get a protective um, impact from it. Um, you, you don't need everyone in Brookline to download it because the coverage comes from the public health department. As long as you have all infected individuals uploading their traces to the platform via safe places, everybody who downloads the app gets the benefit of that. The more people that download it, the better but it doesn't require everyone to download it to get that protective coverage. Does that make sense, Mr. Fernandez? I'm happy to go into greater detail. It does. Do you have a goal, though? Yeah, we're, we, we, we'd obviously like, um, you know, 60%, 70% coverage. Um, we, uh, we are hoping, and, and that's why we're really excited about these pilot communities we're working with. We have resources to support public health education, media, um, we're already getting coverage in, in many media outlets. So this isn't a Brookline do it alone. Um, we see it as a collaboration and we really want to support you and collaborate in how to make the tool better and more effective for the people of Brookline. Um, it's very, very different. Um, we're not a for-profit entity. This is a nonprofit free service view um, that is really meant to figure out together how to best protect the people of Brookline. And the 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 capabilities of the tools today are likely to grow over time as we get the input um, from our pilot sites to, to make it even better and more comprehensive um, as society opens up and the needs needs improve. Let me pause. Thank you. Sure. Have you reached out to um, the hospitals who have, you know, both Beth Israel and Brigham and Women's and MGH and Boston City all have uh, workers who live in this community. And I would think it would be incredibly valuable for them um, to have this tool um, because it would enable contract tra contact tracing to take place much more easily in terms of you know, where they've been that they may have been exposed. Uh, have you reached out to the hospitals to ask them to, uh, to put you in touch with their employees or to somehow uh, have them uh, uh, hold an information session for their employees about this? Um, that's a great question, Ms. Heller. Thank you. Um, we are working very closely with many of the area hospitals. So Mass General Hospital was one of our clinical contributors in um, developing the platform. And um, I believe Mass General and I think the Brigham, I can I can go check um, to, to verify, are um, our, our test sites for, um, for for looking at the impact in kind of micro communities. But right now we don't have 
a comprehensive um, employee um, collaboration with them in terms of rolling it out across across the board. But it's a great idea, and I'll share that with the team. I have two questions. Um, number one, uh, a, a resident has asked uh, the following question. Does this use Bluetooth, which goes through walls? Okay, that's one question you probably can answer fairly quickly. Um, um, yes, so in terms of the, um, the data inputs right now, it is GPS-based, but um, over the next couple of weeks, it's being enhanced to lever bo leverage both GPS and um, Bluetooth. Um, in addition, Apple and Google are putting out APIs and in about six weeks, they've, they've indicated, um, which will enable enhanced um, location tracking services on their phones. Um, and the platform will have the capability to link in with those APIs um, to support um, to support those technologies. So um, Bluetooth and GPS each have different um, uh, pros and cons when it comes to tracing. Um, Bluetooth is better at saying um, you're in a very close proximity where exposures exist when two Bluetooth phones can talk to each other and create a close proximity trace. GPS is much better at, at tracing um, movement over um, over periods of time, um, as well as, um, as 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 kind of geographic mapping of, of of movement and risk. So the team is putting those two things together to get the most comprehensive tracing possible. Um, the individual is is able to kind of turn on and off. Um, the type of tracing that's happening on their phone. The app has the capability for a full opt-in um, on, on how the trace is occurring. And, and so just one uh, point of clarification, um, Chair. I was bringing this forth as an opportunity to hear um, a collaboration I've been working on for some time now, but it was not seeking a vote because it's just a pilot test. It's not something that's going to be permanent. It sounds it sounds very worthwhile, and given that contact tracing as we do it now is so laborious, and uh, takes so much time to end up with the results, that uh, sometimes the results are already too late. So to help you know to help people who may have been exposed or whatever. So I mean I'd like to know how you download it, and I'd like to get it, even though I don't. I'm, I'm basically sheltering in place, so I don't know that I'm a very good uh, candidate for this, but there are occasions when I do have to leave the house for essential services. So um, I'm trying to minimize them, but uh, I think it would be uh, a good thing to do. So I, you should probably let us and let the public know how um, those who are interested could uh, download the app and become a part of this pilot. Right. Hey, um, my second question, and I got cut off, second, not by the seller, but um, so we say that this is uh, a totally voluntary, but you also said at uh, one point that um, people who have tested positive um, will have uh, their information uploaded to the, uh, to the app. So, so it, it sounds like if you test positive, you're going to be included in the uh, database for this uh, for this app. Is that correct? Um, that's only correct if that individual opts in to having their trace uploaded um, onto safe places. So, basically, the the per, the individual would have the choice to um, to, to say um, yes. Actually, I'll, I'll download the app, get my trace for the last two weeks, and then upload it to, um, to Dr. Jen and his team for, um, for review. Or an individual has an absolute opportunity and right to say, no, let's just have a conversation. So this isn't a requirement. This isn't mandatory. It's 100% voluntary. And again, if the individual, once diagnosed, decides to opt in and upload their data, when the data is uploaded, it's de-identified and contains no personally identifiable information once it re reaches the public health department. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So my question is, um, is it just for people who tested positive to fill out? 
Um, at this point, it is supporting um, only tested positive people who are being um, interviewed by the public health department and sharing their traces as a result of a positive diagnosis. Um, moving forward, there are other um, jurisdictions around the country that we're working with that are looking at self-reported um, and symptom-based diagnosis as a way to um, share potential um, infections and tracing, but that's um, in, in development as opposed to in this current um, version. Okay. Any other questions? So, well, it's, so what you're basically saying is that since as far as I'm aware, none of us here has been diagnosed. None of us would be signing up on the app to be tested uh, or contact traced because we don't we don't have the, the disease. Is that correct? So everyone on the call, assuming no one has COVID right now, could download the app and then receive um, daily uh, information about whether or not you've had exposure to someone who has been diagnosed. So, so you're currently nice. in the in the well population. If you got diagnosed, you could then leverage your tracing history to upload to the public health department um, when having that conversation. So, it, so, so it, it's really valuable because it lets you know that you've been in an area where uh, someone has been diagnosed. Correct. And Absolutely. So that you need to be careful. Yeah. That's correct. And then um, at, you have to assume that all of us are in kind of fluid health statuses. So today, while we're in the healthy group, at any point we could flip and be in the infected group. And so that. So. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Observations, comments. No. Thank you, uh, Dr. Horowitz uh, Willis and uh, Dr. Uh, Gabriel. Um, is it Dr. Garfield? Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what is going to be the process for approving this, Bernard? Um, are we going to just? Uh, I mean, it seems to me that this is something we should do, and that Dr. Jet should be able to. Uh, you know, help with the rollout of this in Brookline. It's a pilot, it's voluntary. Um, it's not as if anybody, we're asking anybody that they have to do it, but I think it's, it's a, it sounds very valuable and um, taking a leap forward in a whole area of contact tracing seems very yeah. important. Well, uh, do, what is it we have to approve? Right. Well, I think I'm just looking for a nod of support um, there's none that you have to vote on because I know it wasn't on the agenda as a voting item. Um, but, but I don't you know, think there's any objection to uh, uh, going forward. Um, you know, and and once we get to the point of you know the town uh, being uh, implicated in um, you know the app or or its rollout, then then you'd come back to us. But um, I don't hear any objection to uh, you participating in the pilot. I appreciate it. And of course, we will subject it to scrutiny in terms of the uh, claims of uh, claims that they make that uh, people's privacy are protected and other claims they make, um, which, of course, uh, my my job and our job is to uh, be skeptical of all those claims. Uh, but that's just the way we are. <laughs> okay. If I may. If I may, yes. Mr. Green, um, just to well. give you some more su some more support, we will evaluate the process. Um, so from the university side, to determine the overall benefit to the community. So there will be some scholarly research produced, so that way we can bring that back to you. If you guys do have any further questions, to show you how valuable this has been to Brookline. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Harris Willis, are you with the university? Yes, sir. I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and the Dr. Gabriel, I'm sorry, where are I get where am I getting Gabriel from? Uh, Dr. Garfield, are, are you with the university also? I'm not. I currently uh, work with EY Ernst and Young, and I'm part of the volunteer group supporting Safe Path. Um, but I am a proud alumni of the Boston University School of Public Health that you mentioned earlier. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, Dr. Howard Willis, uh, what university are we talking about? Is that the local MIT? Um, um, no, it's the Massachusetts Co it's the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. You can shorten that to MCPHS University. Yep, I know it well. Okay, great. So, so Thank that, you. 
that probably chair that gives you a little bit information the contact tracing collaborative that was started through partners in health actually was a collaboration that me and dr willis actually initiated with harvard and so what you've been reading about in the papers for some time now was actually a collaboration that me and dr willis um started several months ago uh, but we didn't take it to this full length uh, we actually work with students pph students at harvard and MIT. And uh, Dr. Willis also, Horace Willis also is a um, prior health commissioner at Plymouth. And he's with the National Guard, which brought this forward as well. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a little more perspective on how we start to bring us together. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see what's, what's next on our agenda. We can sign up. Okay. <laughs> Okay, next. Question of approving select board guidance regarding the health department's advisory on face coverings. Um, this was a guidance that uh, I put together uh, after receiving a lot of uh, questions from people in the community um, about the um, face covering uh, advisory that uh, Dr. Jett uh, initiated last week. Um, gone through some changes with uh, input from, from different people. Uh, is there any discussion of, of this? Um, how, how would you like to proceed? Hello. Who, who are you asking, uh, Bernard? Anyway. The select board. That includes you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think um, I think the gui guidance is updated uh is is very good and very smart i think i think one of the the key considerations for us is how do we get this guidance out there uh yeah. that's been one of the things that um that i think we as a town have struggled with is um how do we communicate um sometimes more complicated information there's a number of different bullet points on this guidance uh it's 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 the kind of thing i suppose we could put into a robocall and um, but it would be a very long robocall uh, to send this out, uh, you know, folks have asked us, you know, if it's the kind of stuff that we should be um, posting at, um, especially businesses that are currently open, uh, where people would be able to see this in on those windows, or you know, what can we do to um, to get what I think is very good guidance out there? Um, I, and have, I have one suggestion, which is, um, am I am I live here or not? Yes, um, I have one suggestion, uh, which is that. Um, we uh, ask the, the various neighborhood associations, perhaps through the Brookline Neighborhood Alliance, um, if they could assist us in um, in posting this on their uh, listservs, um, because they seem to reach a lot of people, people are in, in neighborhood. There's also this app called Nextdoor, which I've just learned about, and my neighborhood is, is involved in, um, in uh, getting postings from it. And so, and I think there are many other neighborhoods in Brookline. I don't know how it would work in terms of whether or not the town could post something on uh, on next door, but I think uh, that's, that's the kind of thing I think we have to resort to because as I'm learning, a lot of people don't, number one, they don't seem to even get the phone calls. And number two, um, they don't get the updated posts, you know, uh, the daily uh, uh, informational things. Now they can go to the notify me a button on our on our webpage, booklinema.gov, and sign up both for the phone calls and emails. But I think our audience here is limited, and so how do we get that information out? Um, maybe the tab would be willing to publish it in full. That's yeah. another uh, idea. But I think that that's, those are some of the things we have to work on a better townwide distribution system. Yeah. But in the meantime, we've got to do something now. So yeah, let me no, suggest that we take this, this opportunity, we're on access television, to plug what the guidance is and uh, start to try and push that message out. So what are we asking people to do? So the main focus of the guidance, the only focus, is uh, to... Uh, discuss the requirement that we have here in Brookline that people wear face coverings 
Uh, by the way, can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, because I'm having computer problems again. Uh, the requirement that people wear face coverings, and, and what this guidance tries to do is to answer many of the questions that we get, you know, by email, by phone, you know, people just running us, running into us. Um, we're not supposed to be in the street, I know, but people have come up to me uh, when I was out uh, and sort of asking, how does this work? So the, the, the purpose is to explain some of the details of you know, what we're talking about. And we're not talking about you can't go outside, but just saying we do go outside, you have to wear a mask um, and the reasons for that and you know how easy it is to either make your own mask or, or acquire a mask through commercial um, sources. Um, and the type of mask that, that we're talking about um, uh, using. So, you know, I, I see it as number one, you know, providing us with a way to answer those questions that we're getting uh, from people in town who are just confused about uh, the fact that they now have to wear a face covering. Uh, you know, they, they don't know why they have to do that. Um, I think we can also distribute uh, this through the town meeting members association in addition to the uh, uh, neighborhood associations, but also probably most importantly, I think if we, we, sh we should get our public relations people to uh, use this in the form maybe of a press release to get some coverage in the broadcast and print media so that we get to um, those people who aren't, you know, uh, that uh, tuned in to what's going on in the town, you know, don't read our web website, um, and otherwise are usually missed by uh, the things that the select board in the town are, are trying to convey to people. Um, this includes especially young people uh, who I think are just recklessly um, going about their business as if there's nothing going on without masks and, 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 and more frequently than, than they should be in groups, um, uh, you know, in, in sort of non-compliance with not only the mask or the face covering uh, requirement, but also our distancing um, advisory. So, you know, we, we can use the broadcast and print media as a way of uh, expanding the coverage of, uh, of, of, you know, this uh, requirement. Um, and, uh, you know, there may be other ways we can just get this around, but I think that, the, you know, those are ways that will really, um, you know, be beneficial in terms of just getting people to accept the fact that this is a very serious problem and it requires a serious and inconvenient uh, response on their part, but it's not unreasonably inconvenient. Um, and, and, you know, we, we really need to uh, you know, get people to take, take seriously that the situation we're in. Yeah, I think this is smart too, is that it, it, in that it changes the default from not wearing a mask to wearing a mask. And of course, if you are alone or with your family in the middle of, of, of Lars Anderson Park, sitting down, having a picnic, and no one is anywhere near you, no one's ex no one's going to come over and ask you whether or not you're wearing a mask um, or, or give you any, any heartache about that. Um, but for those of us that are walking around on the streets, um, we, we tried uh, to provide a little bit extra distance in certain areas. But um, it's really important that, um, you know, you may be walking on a block where where there does seem to be plenty of room and you make a left turn and then all of a sudden there's some folks there. So, um, you know, yeah. it's really important for folks to have this mask with them. The other the other piece that we should be clear about um, is um, is enforcement. Uh, I know that there is a provision by which um, the health department can um, can find folks for not wearing masks, but that's not something that we've discussed or, or has really been contemplated at this point. And correct me, anyone, if I'm wrong, but um, but our sense is that um, that we're just hoping that people just do the right thing and comply, and that this becomes part of our culture for the time being until um, Dr. Jet lets us know that it's that it's um, that it's time to start pulling back on this. Uh, and and there's no intention right now to use our, our police or anyone else to to stop people and and to enforce this. Um, and our hope is that um, that we can encourage people. We know that some people don't yet have masks. Um, you know they are available online, but uh, to buy online. But also, Got Masks Brookline. If you are in need of a mask, there is that website, Got Masks Brookline. You can just search that, uh, and there are people that are willing to. to if you if you're in need and don't have the, the means to get your own, there are people that are willing to make them for you and get them to you. Uh, so um, so please make use of that if that's something you need. 
and and there are a lot of web uh, uh, I'm sorry a lot of um, internet sites that uh, show you how you can make masks uh, very simply from from a bandana um, very effective uh, mask from a bandana or by cutting out a one of those old t-shirts you have around the house um, in, in a form that can be uh, turned into a, a very effective mask uh, and that becomes even more effective based uh, if you put a, a paper, a paper uh, uh, towel uh, in between uh, the layers of the mask. Um, apparently that has been found to increase the effectiveness of even uh, cotton mask uh, significantly. Uh, so, I mean, there, there's no reason why people can't, um, you know, find a way to, to, to obtain a mask and wear it. And uh, hopefully soon we'll have fashionable uh, ma masks um, that uh, people will be proud to wear around to uh, show off their fashion taste. Um, well, I have another suggestion of how to get a mask or how, uh, how to turn something you might have in your house into a mask. Um, this was something that a friend of mine learned on Twitter, uh, and it, it involves these uh, eye coverings. You know, when you go on a plane or you go someplace and you want to sleep and you're sensitive mm. to light, so you put this over your, over your head like that. Okay, so you can turn mm. this into a mask, and um, it works pretty well, actually, and it's pretty comfortable. Uh, so I recommend them. <laughs> if you have them lying <laughs> around, uh, that's a good way. That's a good use to put too, so. Yeah. So when you, as you're cleaning out your house and you run into an eye mask, don't throw that away, but save it. Right. To be repurposed. Exactly. Um, the other thing I, I just want to raise is that I think, um, I think especially maybe young people, but many people are confused about, okay, well, if I'm in an age where I'm young and I'm healthy, I'm going to get the virus, it's going to be like the flu, and then I'm going to be fine. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, the, the people who are more vulnerable, obviously, the people with the underlying conditions and, and the older people, but younger people also, I mean, the problem is you may not die, but um, there's more and more evidence, and there was news reports just today, that um, you can suffer long-term organ damage from this uh, virus. Yeah from your, in your liver, in your heart, in your lungs. No one really knows whether you'll recover from that because this, this virus is in its infancy. But who wants to take that chance? You don't want to go through your life having a, a compromised liver or heart or lungs. So it's really worth making the efforts not to get it yourself and not to give it to other people. Yeah, that's important. But the, uh, the the focus, I think, that we also have to um, um, have is that the purpose of the mask is not to protect you, but to protect people who you come in contact with, because especially young people uh, could have the virus and have no symptoms and are going around contagious and infecting other people. Wearing a mask helps to prevent that. So you don't, you know, inadvertently... Uh, in fact, a friend of yours who lives with his 80-year-old uh, grandmother, who if, they, if she gets the uh, virus, could die. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, you know, the other side that we have to really emphasize. It's not just, not just you that we're protecting. We're protecting everyone around you by requiring that uh, you wear uh, face coverings. And I don't know. Or elaborate on this. So I think the, the purpose here is to reduce the transmission rate of the virus. I mean, uh, Dr. Um, Horowitz uh, Willis uh, used the phrase "are not," which mean, which is the transmission rate, um, and reduce that to a level, you know, below one, that we have the virus under control uh, and can begin to uh, reduce uh, the need to uh, take you know extraordinary measures to. Um, you know, keep people separate and and, and uh, close down uh, businesses. But you know, but the, the way that we do that is to get a significantly large percentage of the population protecting each other by wearing masks, so that uh, the rate of transmission of this disease uh, is reduced as low as possible. Now, of course, Brookline is not you know it, it's not an island to itself. So hopefully, 
um, you know, other governments are and, and you know, will increasingly um, you know, require uh, facial coverings in, in, in their areas. I think Boston is and, and you know, other surrounding communities. So you know, this is a regional um, initiative that uh, you know, we, we really need to uh, you know, play a big role in. So um, I, I kind of want to go back to uh, what was mentioned at the very beginning of this meeting, where uh, I guess a decision has been made to use sound trucks. Um, I remember us talking about the possibility of that. I actually don't think that they will be that effective at getting people to wear masks. So uh, I would like to see what the other select board members have to say about that. Yeah. Well, you know, it, I mean, it depends on where they're used. Uh, for example, you know, I was out walking along, um, I think it's called Leverett uh, Park uh, next to the, uh, or Olmsted Park next to Leverett Pond. Uh, huge number of people running uh, without masks and, you know, whooshing by you. And, you know, both sweat as well as, um, you know, uh, stuff coming out of their mouth into the air, um, which, you know, is, is a very risky thing. Um, to have a sound truck, you know, there to just remind people that, you know, there is a requirement that they wear a mask and, and why that's important, I think could be very effective. Now, maybe going down, you know, Harvard Street is not uh, the best use of that, uh, uh, that, that um, system, but, you know, there are places where it could make a big, big difference by just reminding people that you know, this is a serious issue, this is a serious disease, and, and we really expect people to take it seriously by uh, their behavior, particularly uh, use of face coverings. So I, I think that, uh, I, I guess I just disagree. The people who are not using face masks, there are a number of reasons why, and I think we should investigate what those reasons are. You bring up the youth that think that they're invincible. A sound truck is not going to change their mind. So I would like us to contemplate other actions. I mean, people respond differently when there are consequences. Yeah. Um, so yeah. a sound truck is just a public information campaign. We've been doing that for weeks. They know yeah. risks. They know the expectations, you know, that are, that we've put out. I don't see how this is really going to affect a different outcome. I agree with you that there are probably other things we can do, but I don't think this hurts. In other words, I, I think that there, I've seen, um, you know, families uh, walking along, parents with young children, and there's no masks. Um, and they're, you know, walking by other people and they're in Coolidge Corn, whatever. So I, I just don't think this hurts. It's not as if we're going to be doing this at midnight and waking everybody up. Uh, we're going to do it during the middle of the day. And, uh, you know, but I agree with you that there may be other, there may and there should be other things that we can do to impress upon people the reasons why it's really important. So the unintended consequence is that we're assuming that everybody is up during the day. And that's just not true, especially the people who have been working very long, very um, sporadic hours, which are our frontline workers. And we think that noontime is an appropriate time to, you know, sound something that you know, can reach a distance, and yet that person has not slept in 36 hours. I think that's really unfair for the expectation of the change in behavior. Can I just speak here? Uh, this is Mel Clack there. Um, so we have no current plans uh, for sound trucks. We're obviously aware of um, the work that City of Boston is doing, um, and we want to look at that. I mean, I know the City of Boston is using multiple languages, and I think it's really important that we think this out before we actually do it and so as far as i know there's no current immediate plans to to do this uh, but you know, we will certainly uh, evaluate it and i know that uh, select board member green has, has talked about that yeah and and, and this uh, dr J, i just want to add i have asked staff and the uh, department has to put together sort of uh, education campaign on what you would do for any other um, health promotion we might do and find creative ways where we could post this um, uh, across Brookline and use different avenues that we have used before. 
Um, I have often wondered we only, we, our bandwidth is only about 2,000 residents. I want to expand and make sure we cover 59,000 people. And so I think we have to look at creative ways in order to do that and how we educate people. I just don't think we have reached the masses. All right. I'll just, I'll just weigh in briefly. I, I think um, I agree that we, we need to find more and more ways to reach more people. Uh, I think anything that adds uh, more sound and noise to the environment right now is not desirable. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't support that either at this point. Um, yeah, it's off to say about that. So I agree with select person Fernandez and select person Hamilton. I think um, we may get to a point in the future where we've exhausted all our other uh, options and sound trucks may be the only thing left on the table. But I think there are a lot of things we can do today uh, and over the next couple of days and weeks short of sound trucks. I also think one, one of the things that we need to do is be clear and precise in our message. And, and I think this is something that uh, Select Person Fernandez has said in previous weeks, uh, drawing on his past public relations experience. Uh, we, can, we can spread a message uh, far and wide, but if it's not clear and succinct, then nobody's gonna understand. So in that spirit, the message that we're trying to deliver to the community tonight is, when you go outside, wear a mask. If you are wondering whether you should wear a mask or you don't need to wear a mask, wear a mask. When in doubt, put the mask on. There is no plans to do fines or enforcement at this time. We're asking for voluntary compliance, but in the future, that may change based on experience and observation about compliance with this request for, for wearing masks. So it looks like um, there's no support on the board for sound trucks. But let me just add, when we talk about sound trucks, we're not talking about you know, 30, 50 decibel uh, sounds. I mean, these are, and it's, it's basically a loud talking through a microphone uh, by a car that uh, maybe is driving down the pathway on, um, on Olmstead Park. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the idea that this is going to intrude on people sleeping and, and other things is uh, not, not uh, what the issue is here, but you know the board doesn't like it anyway, so we'll take that uh, as you know our current uh, position. Any other discussion? Okay, I move approval of the select board guidance regarding the health department advisory on face coverings. All in favor, Mr. Franco? Aye. Ms. Heller? Aye. Ms. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Fernandez? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Uh, that is there anything else on our agenda? Um, no, that concludes our agenda. Anything else that people uh, want to raise? More and more thanks to everybody that's out there working to keep us up and running. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, can I uh, urge uh, members of the board to uh, whatever, in whatever amount you can support the uh, safety net fund and the, uh, I think, you know, the food pantry in particular, because that, that is getting a huge amount of uh, demand. Um, and uh, I, I can't imagine that, uh, you know, any amount of money that you can contribute to them wouldn't be greatly appreciated. And it's getting demand from people who you would not expect to, uh, you know, need that type of who have been laid off from their jobs um, and are really, really suffering um, as a result of this uh, virus. So uh, I hear, unless there's anything else, I'll join, uh, uh, join, excuse me, I will join the meeting. Anything else? And thank you everybody for your support. Thank you. Thanks Dr. Jeff. I know. Not all.